as you saw, I'm sure, in my message, um, we are um, beginning an LMS review. We're going to be looking at three products. Blackboard is the first product that um, we're having demonstrated. And I'm glad that you're here because, as I said, even though you know, you're, you're already using Blackboard, um, you're going to be seeing some things that are coming. So, um, you know, feel free to, you know, bring up questions or whatever. And again, I created this form just as a way for if you'd like to take notes and give us some feedback, that would be excellent. The other thing that um, I hope you will uh, be keeping in mind is that I'm going to be sending out a call pretty soon to um, ask people if they would like to um, try out the new Blackboard um, with like a unit or an entire course, possibly this summer or the fall. Um, so as you're looking at these new features, and you might think to yourself, hey, you know, I want to try that. That opportunity is coming. So you will have the chance to try this out and put either an entire course or part of a course into this newer version um, just to give it a real sort of test drive. So um, this is Brian DeKemper, he's our Blackboard representative, and I'm going to let him introduce himself, and you might, we might want to just get a real quick where everybody's from kind of intro also. Thanks, Susan. Um, I've met, it looks like I've met probably a fair handful of folks in here. I'm, if you were in a session that I gave in November, I might be sort of familiar. I was here in November and we talked about some similar things, but my name is Brian. I work with um, some schools within the state. I uh, from Blackboard and like Susan said just here to show a little bit about what we've been working on what's new from what we have out today compared to the version that you're on today um, and then as part of that hopefully generate a lot of good Q&A and if you have most times when people show up they've got a little uh, list of things like four or five things that they really want to know about and they'll ask so uh, you're laughing so you might have a couple but if you do this is the the time to ask um, and Susan has some you know things on the sheet of, of what we're going to cover and what you can probably think to ask about. If you have anything like that, very open dialogue. <coughs> just let me know. I'm glad to share whatever we have and as part of it kind of tell you a little bit about what we're working on for the future as well. <coughs> so with that, um, let's go around and do a quick your name and sort of maybe the department that you represent or what you do. I'm Cynthia Miller. I'm with Advanced Education Programs and I've been working with Blackboard um, from the 90s when I designed courses at UNC and put them in VISTA and, oh. and but went through several revisions and I'm really disappointed at the, at the lack of uh, <coughs> progress in Blackboard compared to other emerging uh, LMSs. Good way to start it off. So I'm going to hopefully impress you with what we've got here. I've got an appointment for, so I'm hoping it'll be. I'll, I'll make it short and sweet. But but to your point, um, a lot of the things that we've been working on, the version that you're on is about a year and a half old or so, maybe a little bit more than that. So what we've got to show you are things that we've had out in the field for a while. So um, you, you'll be one of the ones I'm hoping to see if I can get a smile on your face by the end of the presentation. Okay. Okay, good. This is perfect. If they're all online, they're all blackboard. I don't even see the students. Okay. Good. There will be some things that I'll specifically point out for you then as well. I'm Justin Greenleaf. I'm from the Department of Leadership Studies. Okay. Grace, we know you. If you know, well, Fanbite doesn't know Grace. Okay. Mary Mickensoft, elementary education. Susan, I would, where we went, I would like to do that this summer. Oh, I would like to do that this summer. I have one class this summer and I'm 59 in the fall. We got oh, a good okay. volunteer. Cool. Great, great, good news. Right behind Mary there. Okay. Yes, of course, we lost Oh, it's okay. Or, yeah, you're fine. Um, I'm Patty Griffin, I'm the director of the advising center. Okay. But I teach in communication studies and I oversee the succeeding in college class. Okay. And then right next to Penn? Uh, Nikki Brown, I'm the coordinator over in the advising center. Okay. And right here? Tanya Smith, our senior. Okay. Mr. Weigel, Allied Health. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Chapman Rackaway, Political Science. I can guarantee you I have more questions than you have time for. Okay. Well, that might be a good point. Since we do have a tight hour, I'll sort of give the, the uh, clarification up front that I'll do everything I can to answer the questions. But if I can't, I promise to follow up. So, you know, shoot me an email, write me, we'll, I'll get a follow-up for you. Good point. Right here. Marcel Morris, Communication Studies. Okay. Jim Barrett, Chair of Advanced Ed Programs. Okay. Mark Griffin, I'm with the Competing Center. Okay. Hey, Mark, you look familiar. We're here in uh, I was here in November. November. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Rita Alk, Institute of Applied Technology. Okay. Instructional Technology courses. Excellent. I'm Sherry Severson, I'm with Portland Library. Mary Alice Wade, I'm also from Forsyth Library. I'm Lynn Haggard, also with Forsyth Library. Library sticks together over here. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> well, good. Okay. Well, um, so again, thanks everybody for coming. Hopefully, some of the good things that I'll show you uh, are things that you're either interested in. Um, whether it's time-saving types of things or just interested in um, to the initial comment about the sort of progress that Blackboard's made or what we've been working on, I'm excited to probably show you a little bit about that too. So, um, so a quick bit of information, and I promise I'll, we're eight minutes in, I'll skip straight to the demo to show you the good stuff, but some of the focus from a corporate perspective, I've, and to give you a background on me, I've been around for almost, or going on eight years, I've been in um, managed hosting, support management, various roles, and now I do, uh, I've lost my mind and now I do account management for some reason. But I like it and I haven't been asked to quit yet or leave, so we'll keep with it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, feedback loops that we've created to try to capture great, uh, you know, feedback from the field. What people want, you know, how many types of folks and the types of programs that we put on to build things into the product, and maybe how that might contrast to other uh, products that you look at. So maybe one of the things that you want to ask the other folks that come in is how do they prioritize the feedback from the field and in the way that they bake that in the product. Added value, a lot of the other things that maybe you've known about Blackboard in the past have um, been about uh, added licensing and different sorts of things. Some people sort of come in with a, a perception of the company. Uh, a big focus of the last few years is about building core uh, functionality in the core product as well. So everything I talk about today is not about selling you more stuff. It's about what you can do in the current investment that you have today. Um, and then sort of moving forward, I've got four or five slides of things that will come out this summer that I think you'll be really excited about. And then two things that came out in an update that was actually released just last night. Unfortunately, it was so new that I couldn't um, get demo access, but I have a couple slides to share that I think you'll like. So with that, um, let me jump through and share a couple bits of information for you. For those that don't know, if you have any desire to participate in a beta program, a limited field trial, any of our accessibility or usability programs, we have a very broad swath of uh, programs that we've created to try to capture input from the field. And some of the things that we've captured, um, as an example, over 2,000 individual people contributed to some part in terms of their feedback to the release that came out last night through this variety of programs. You know, they voted, they've said you should do this instead of that. I like this, des this design as opposed to that one. We try to do a lot and instead of investing in free t-shirts and things to send out to people, we invest in programs like this. I joke about this. I have people that say, Brian, I got a nice t-shirt from one of your competitors. Why don't you ever do that? Because we're taking that t-shirt money and we're spending it on programs where we can try to help improve the product as well. Um, and then as part of that, what we're doing is we're getting more people on the most recent version of the product. As we change the way that we release software in a way that is more palatable to institutions as well. So I won't go into the dirty details, but to the point of, you know, maybe you're on a little bit of an older version so you don't get to see the latest and greatest. We're trying to get to a point where it's easier for you to see that without having some huge mammoth upgrade in the process. Um, so again, the statistics here, the takeaway is that we're getting more of our customers on the same version, which is good for everybody. QA, design, everybody gets to see the newer things more frequently when they come out as well. So with that, um, I'll go through and just start a couple things within the demo. And I heard that, uh, were you 
Susan, did you tell me that Cable Green was here recently? Cable Green was just here about two weeks ago, and there's a lot of interest in open educational resources and looking at ways to integrate um, free and very low cost digital materials into courses. Okay. So let me see if I've, I'm not sure why that's doing that. It's a crazy build here. So one of the things that we do in the background too at Blackboard, pay attention to the bottom part of this, is that we partner with publishers as well as the IMS Consortium who helps go through and design um, along with um, the Open Education, OER, Open Education Resource, the folks that um, work in these different consortiums around open and uh, compatible content so that if you create something it can be used at a different institution regardless of what LMS you're using you know you have equity in something you don't lose that if you upgrade or if you switch systems so what we do at Blackboard um, for those that don't know our president actually wrote the white paper on the concept of the common cartridge so this concept of being able to have a, a course that you can export and move it to Moodle move it to Canvas move it to D2L whatever you want to do with it it's a common denominator of functionality and he's very passionate about content both with publishers and open education resources so one of the things I'll share with you today is a new tool that we have for managing and sharing um, open education resources managing copyrights sharing that both within Fort Hayes and within other institutions as well if you want to do that so if you have a passion for open education resources let me know and I can dig into that in more detail as well with that I'm going to jump into uh, a short demonstration that kind of covers some of the things that I think will be important to you, um, some of the things that will be new to you from the version of Blackboard that you use today. And I, I, uh, I tend to talk a little faster than I want to sometimes. I, I try to, I, we have these uh, public speaking classes internally and they're like, Brian, you got to slow it down a little bit. So if I go too fast, just tell me to wind it back a little bit and I promise I'll try. But we'll start with a couple things that are new. Um, the first thing is you'll notice for those that have a really uh, attentive eye up here, we have a new push notification system that lets you see what's new inside a course. So of course this is stolen from um, anybody that has a smartphone or a tablet in front of them. Um, it's stolen from that little notification when you have a missed call, when you got an email, when you got a text message, whatever that is. So in Blackboard in the past, one of the things that we haven't had, and this came out, this is something that came out last fall, you don't really have an easy way to see what's new. You log in. How do you know what's going on in your course, right? How do you know if you're a faculty member what you have to grade, what you're doing? Um, so what we've done is we've got a new notifications dashboard here to show you anytime there's an update in the system. If you're a student, you can see new announcements, new content that's been graded. Um, in part of that, we also have, I'll kind of start from the bottom here, there's also a new calendar. So how many folks, I always jokingly say this, how many people use the calendar in Blackboard today? What's your impression of what you get out of the calendar today? I can't say that publicly because we're being recorded. There you go. So to, to my point, the, the old Blackboard calendar, we've had, um, it's, it was number one on our uh, client feedback reports for things that we need to do something with for about uh, 13 months. So late last year, we had a new update to the calendar finally. And this is what the calendar looks like now. We have an actual usable calendar that lets you see your courses that you're either teaching or taking overlaid and then you could even set up automated um, types of events maybe it's a recurring event and that's nice for onesie twosie types of things but what it also does is if you create a new assignment if you have a test with a due date all that stuff automatically gets populated on the calendar uh, yeah. So, so let me show you a, a couple quick examples here that follow that track and also triggers the updates and things as well. So, a quick workflow to demonstrate this. So, I'm going to go into my demo course here. Um, I'm going to create a new uh, Dropbox assignment. So, very, very simple, um, common thing. It's just an assignment tool. I'll create that for the sake of the demo. I'll call it Fort Hayes State Assignment. And this could be, this is going to play into another thing that you're going to hopefully, we got applause from the calendar, you'll really get applause with something else here in a little bit. Oh, they're going to go nuts when they see this. So I'll select a rubric. Does anybody use gradable rubrics today? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. So you can align your rubrics to the content just like you always have. Um, so what I'm doing is, all I'm doing now is specifying the due date. And I'll make the due date tomorrow. And when I hit submit, now what happened is on all the students, as well as the faculty member as well, obviously, that has been sent out 
in the form of an update to students. And now when I go to my calendar, I now see this assignment that's been put on there. So it gets better. If you go through now, if you're a faculty member, and let's say that students are actually going through and submitting assignments, you can use this as a course navigation tool. So let's say that you want to go through and grade content from the calendar. You could actually go through and if there were submitted items, you could grade from here. You could go and edit the assignment if you wanted. And then what you can also do is let's say that, well maybe the 26, um, you know, there was a flood and one of the buildings campus was closed. You want to make the due date Monday. All you do is, is drag and drop the, the item. Yes, yeah. So, so just like what we have, um, so the students, one of the things that's also built into this new navigation tool is sort of a, uh, an, an automated push of different updates. So I'll click on that now to show you. But if I create a piece of content or if I change the date like I just did, the students are actually going to see a push notification for a new piece of content that's been made available. So just like I could on the calendar, they can click on open and go to it or they could dismiss the you know the assignment maybe they're a procrastinator they'll just immediately hit snooze and you know they'll come back to it hopefully um, but those are a couple of big updates to the calendar some of the other things let me show you I'll jump back to it some of the questions we had in the previous session the natural set of questions that you have normally right after that are it's good to have a calendar in Blackboard but I have you know my calendar on my phone or on my tablet or on my computer so what you can do is you can actually have your Exchange calendar or your Google calendar subscribe to Blackboard so it pulls the content into your Exchange or Google calendar by generating this iCal link and then you just feed that into your, your current calendar. Now I will say that in our session we just finished with our tech support folks, we're checking on if this is going to be able to integrate with Lotus. Yeah. Um, but if you use Google calendar... The iCal from Athletics works perfect in Lotus. <sighs> Download the schedule every year. Yeah. Oh, sports. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad. I was yeah. going to say, a lot of sports, that's how I know yeah. it. A lot of sports yeah. schedules yeah. you can go out and grab that way. So, so yeah. we're, we're kind of chipping away at a couple things here. Again, number one on the, on the Blackboard hit list, this was one of a few things. I'll show you a couple more of, you know, hey guys, you need to work on that. <laughs> um, so I'll come back to that assignment tool later as a student and show you some other things that also go along with the grading workflow. The, um, the other things that you'll notice over here though, this new My Blackboard navigation is going gonna, is gonna to be something that we want people to be able to, to go in here and again see whatever types of updates are there, announcements, this could be system-wide announcements. You may have noticed there's some video clips and things built into here, so we respect anything that you can do inside the HTML editor as well. Uh, so let me go into my course and create some new content to show you a couple things with the new HTML editor. So we have a new HTML editor, a content editor, whatever you might call it. And I'll maximize the screen here to show you. So in the past, anybody today ever, I always ask this question of things that really, you know, pet peeves of, of people because I know it bothers me too. But when you click in the HTML editor today, sometimes it doesn't respect hard returns or breaks. It's fonts, so sometimes it automatically space is over. People go completely bananas about this. Yeah, so, because we look like we're incompetent. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, and one of the reasons it's taken a little while to get that fixed is because every, every part of the content area is everywhere in Blackboard. So anytime you, either you're a student and you submit content or you're a faculty member and you create content, this touches everything. So it's, it's a little tricky to, to fix, and, but we have an entirely new editor. A uh, couple things that you'll like. Let me show you, um, so copy and paste from Word was something that we were very, very methodical about. So I just did a control C in a Word document that has all kinds of crazy font changes and things like that. Um, so now I can go through and hit control V and you notice that I'll full screen it. It's scrunched my resolution for the projector, that's why it's doing that. But it's done everything that I had from my Word doc inside and you haven't had to do anything and actually if you do tables and things as well you know it respects tables bullet, point bullet points you know, the bullets are easy the tables were actually a tough part um, so the only thing it wouldn't do is if you have videos embedded somewhere else obviously you need to you know re-embed that but it works really well so far 
we had this new, <laughs> well, well, there's always, you know, when, when people come along and ask about what about the video, you know, different things. So that's why I say that. I'm always quick to do, be very transparent. We also have that full screen mode up there. So if you want to edit, you know, either um, in small screen or full screen, you can do that as well. Um, you still have the ability to go through and, and drag and resize like that, but I always thought that the full screen was pretty cool. And then you also have a preview mode if you want to just preview it and see what it looks like as well. Um, so the part that came out last night, anybody in a, a math or science discipline? I know we had a couple of folks in nursing and things as well that may have science backgrounds. Um, so the math editor that we had in the past, including here today, relies on a Java applet to fire up. That's the old applet. Um, today, the update that just came out last night no longer requires this. It actually will open on its own without requiring Java. It's all Ajax and JavaScript based. So no more compatibility problems, both for your students and for you. And if you um, use either uh, MathML or LaTeX, LaTeX, depending on your pronunciation of math equations and different things that are out there, you can do direct copy and paste with that MathML editing now as well in the new editor. Yeah, so the exact, a good example would be any type of externally available content, Khan Academy, anything that you stream from YouTube through the mashup as well. Um, and Khan, Khan Academy, you're giving me more great things to work on. I've got something cool to show you on that. students who go there all the time who are struggling and tutoring is not helping because you can stop. I mean, it just, it's, it's just something that I it's a good It's a good tool, so much so, in fact, that we've made it a default um, option for uh, a content tool that you can now use. So I'll show you that here in just a second. So um, actually I forgot to show you one other thing. So a part of the new updates right there, you may have noticed in the HTML editor, we now have a, a webcam utility. So if you want to do a quick video capture recording, either introduce yourself in the course or let students introduce themselves through a series of discussion posts, you can do that. You say quick, give me an idea of how long. Is that two minutes? Yeah, or is there a memory? Oh, no. So what it does is, and, and good question, we are using a YouTube API, so it's not saving the file on the server. It's not utilizing any local storage. Okay. Okay. So, ten minutes. so you could make it as long as you want you, until people fall asleep on the other end, you know. Um, so you go through, it, it does require a YouTube account, so keep that in mind. So that's, that's the only real requirement. And then once you do that, you hit record. Um, as soon as you record, so I'll start recording here, you know, this is going to warn you about recording, that's fine, we'll record it. Um, so this could be something like grading feedback, this could be something like you introducing yourself in the course, and then once you record it... And the students have access to this, so if we want them to do live presentations, they yeah. can record those directly. Yeah. Can they do that inside the discussion board? They can. Anywhere the editor exists. They just have to have the... And there's no time limit on it? No time. Well, uh, it, in theory, it's probably hours, but yeah. I mean, there's no. Well, I'm just thinking because it, YouTube, they, YouTube, the basic course director for all the public speaking classes. So, you know, the longest yeah. that they could possibly have is right around eight and a half to ten minutes. Yeah. And if they can do that. Yeah. Initially, when you start up running, they'll cut you off in a few minutes. And then after a while, you get another. Okay. So it fits for, for your length. And my follow up for that mm -hmm. is if. Does it take forever then for the page to load if, let's say, a student has four speeches right there? Uh, so I don't know about the four speeches. So it's, it's going to load as quickly as it would any other you know, YouTube video out there. So, so it depends on their connection. Yeah, their okay. connection, the thumbnail. I mean, typically it's going to load like these. I've got, you know, these are some, my, my son here. But um, <laughs> the, webcam, the webcam video, you know, I can insert something that I recorded before. And use that. You get to select if it's a thumbnail or if it opens in a new, you know, window. You can even go back to um, the browse and edit if you want to make it publicly available, not publicly available, private, unlisted, all those different types of settings. But to the point just made here, uh, I'm working with a school in Arkansas that they use this for their public speaking courses, and they do it, you know, full distance. They never see their students in person. To, kind of to your point as well. Um, so something new. You know, we have an FAQ for students and for faculty so that you can get this in the hands of folks to see the five steps you got to have if you want to utilize this. Um, and then from there, so I just oh, upload this terrible video and then have to delete it later. Uh, but it goes right into the editor. And then, yeah, it's, it's saved in my personal YouTube account, yeah. Yeah, so now when I hit 
submit, and I'll have to go and delete this. No, this is my demo server. I don't care. So now this is showing up here. Um, so to the point, this is going to load as quickly as the, you know, the things in the background load, which is typically pretty quick. Um, so some other updates to the actual discussion tool itself. Let me show you that. We mentioned, um, can you use this in a discussion? We got that question in the back. We've updated the discussion forum interface because it hadn't been updated in a long time, to be quite honest with you. So um, let me go back. Yeah, so we, we got a testimonial. It was awful. So, so tell me. Yeah, no, no. Tell me what you think when you see what we've got here. So we've changed the way that you can actually respond. So this looks the same. But if I go in and actually look at a new thread right here. We see a couple things. So number one, we're changing the way that replies and initial posts show up. Mm -hmm. So you'll see that this top um, from the initial author, from the faculty member, mm -hmm. it's in gray. So we're ha we have a visual indicator there. For those that choose to publish a, some profile information, you'll notice that that user profile information now shows up as well. So if you want to, you know, you can always have the ability to go in and see, you know, that person's information, that personal connection for those that never set foot or those that teach pure online, you know, you'll probably have a lot of value for that. That also shows up in all the other interactive tools, blogs, wikis, journals, even in the roster. So you can go to your roster and see all their profile photos in the roster as well. So just for the sake of time, though, I won't show you every one of those. Um, the other part of the discussion that we've updated was a feature that we stole from Angel Learning. I came from the Angel Learning Company myself originally through acquisition, and one of the features that the Angel discussion tool had was what we called post first, which means that students can't see any other posts unless they themselves mm -hmm. post first into the forum. So it requires them to have some original content instead of just reading everybody else's and regurgitating. Yeah, so that's, that's, an, that's a small, but you know, you got good feedback right away. So a small but powerful update there as well. Yeah, so that's exactly what we have now. We've changed the way that sort of the directions show up as well. A couple of other small things, but um, overall the layout, the way that you see things as being marked as red, um, the uh, user rating, peer rating, and evaluation is a little bit different. So again, not a lot of, you know, dramatically different, but small things that make a big difference, I think. Um, let me go through... Um, so let me go through and give you, I created that assignment a little bit ago, the assignment that posted the date on the calendar, you know. Yeah. So let me show you one other thing that's, that's new there from a student's perspective. So I'll jump out, log in as a student, and I've got that Word document here saved on my desktop. I'll just close it out. Yes, that's fine. And now I'll go in and see that I've got a couple updates here as a student. So this is what you would expect. This is the design of that. So I've got this new assignment that's been created. I can click on it and hit open. And it's going to go straight to my assignment tool. And now I can submit my, you know, the paper that I'm going to submit here. So what is different about this that, you're, uh, that you'll see is, I'll browse my computer. I can't do two things at once, so hold on. I'll find my file. What's different about this is that in the past, this workflow was, uh, could be kind of painstaking from a, a grading perspective. So if you have 50 students in your pure online course, you're going to have 50 papers, which means 50 downloads, mm -hmm. 50 save as is, 50 grading, mark it up, turn revisions on in Word, save it, re-upload it with your feedback, you know, that whole thing. So now as a student, when I hit submit, we've introduced a new rendering tool called Crocodoc for those that have ever heard of that. So when the student submits, they're never going to be sort of in question about if their document submitted correctly. They'll see it rendered inside Blackboard. And now what's going to happen is I can jump out. They can download their original if they want. Now I'm going to log back out and log in as a faculty member. And you'll see that there's no longer any need to download and re-upload. So now I'll see as a faculty member and be able to grade in that same frame that I just showed you. So here, again, I'll use my notifications dashboard. I've got an update. And that update is I've got an assignment that's been submitted. Um, actually, it hasn't. There we go. Needs grading. So the assignment has been submitted. I can hit grade from right here in my list of updates. 
And when I hit grade, it's going to go to the needs grading view and I see, okay, well, I've got this person just submitted that paper. I click on the user attempt to grade it. And now I'm going to be able to grade it in line without having to download the file. So just like you can do your revisions inside Microsoft Word, you can go and you can, you can do a strike through. You can... You Safe Assign is next. I appreciate the push there. Sorry. No, no, it's perfect. It's, it's every single person asks that. If you guys use Safe Assign, um, so it's, it's, it's coming. So this is, that's the next. You can insert comments here. Yeah. Yeah. But will it group them? Maybe it would group them together or not? You can, it, it'll actually render them, and I'll show you here in a sec. You can choose what updates you see and you don't see. You can sort it by class, so you can, you can choose. But, um, so I've just done some marking up. I gave this person an A. Brian is an excellent student, so I gave him an A. If, you've, if you use the grading rubrics, you can even um, you get your grading rubric out right here. And if you have two screens, which I normally do at home, or if you do at work, I don't know. But you can have all this on one screen. You could even render it inline if you wanted to, if you use a little inline grading rubric. So I just used my rubric to score it. I did the markup. I can now go and add grading comments. This is where we just did a little test in the previous session where someone wanted to give a video feedback of 30 seconds of, here's what I thought was great. This is why I marked you this on the rubric, yada da. You hit submit. Now the student, you know, the cycle continues. We jump back out as a student. The student sees their original. They also see the graded version. They see the feedback. You know, you see the kind of that continuous loop of what we want to see here. How do the students see the video you're recording? They see it as a thumbnail, just like I kind of had earlier. So I can. It doesn't have anything like SoundCloud, like instead of just a audio only. Yeah. No, we don't yeah, do audio. I want to show my face every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Put some tape over the uh, the old webcam and use the audio. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, to, to the. Sometimes showing your face, it's a distractor. You're just listening just to like whatever you think that. Yeah. 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 So the, the, to the point there, the, um, this is really the HTML editor piece that I showed you that does that is very specific to video. Um, much like anything else that we do in Blackboard, there are plugins and what we call mashups. So let me show you an example here. So this little mashup tool inside the editor, I don't know if you've ever seen this today, for those of you that have, we have mashup options for audio recording tools as well. So this could be a commercial, a SoundCloud, whatever it might be. It could be a third-party provider. It could be a lecture capture software that you use. Whatever, Adobe Connect, I know that's a license here. Mm -hmm. Any of these types of tools, you could actually blend that into the mashup tool if you didn't want to use um, YouTube here. You have three options there, right? That's the older version. Correct. This is extensible. So uh, the only options I have there are out of the box. But if you wanted to, that's where you could add in you know, the additional third-party pieces as well. Is that an it depends on what the tool is. So like SoundCloud is an example. I'd say 50-50. There's some freebie tools out there. It would be good to include everything so you can just go and pick bringing every system in so that you mm -hmm. have a choice. Yeah. I mean, that would for example, when you want to upload a, a movie, you can't do it because it doesn't give you that option. It becomes so difficult. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so time consuming. Yep. Well, that's, that's what we would do here with our installation. We need to determine what third-party tools we would integrate. I'm wondering about VoiceThread, if that might be one option we'd want to look at for that. Well, VoiceThread actually is a good example because it has an LTI integration. So we, to the acronym SOUP, um, there's a new tool interoperability sort of plugin that allows very easy um, interactive access, interactive, I don't know what I'm saying, integrations <laughs> to interactive tools that you could add in, but VoiceThread is one of them. So if you use that today, you could plug that in we through an LTI. And we have a so perfect example. No more investment. You could use that here as a mashup if you wanted to. For discussions, do you have any other um, feature that brings all the students together? And something like VoiceThread, but, you know, 28, 30 students? Uh, I'm not sure. In the discussion, just... Let me go through on, and... Um, you know, not in text form, but sound. Oh, I see. Yeah, not, not today. No, not today. The, 
for Adobe, but you know, yeah. you see everyone, they see you, you make comments, everybody, everybody. Go yeah. to meet, go meeting, go to Go to meeting. Yeah. yeah, here, let me show you something in just a sec here too. So one of the other things that I've um, not gone into much detail on, in addition to some of the other features that are available in the new My Blackboard mm -hmm. part right here, we also have a new profile tool. So if you want to, you can create a user profile. I showed the, the example of the photo that would follow the, in the roster and the content items. So you could also go through and see other people in the system. So this could be, this is our, our take on social learning. So you could see other people that have created a user profile, that have chosen to make it visible in some way inside Blackboard, and then you could go through and you know communicate with them, send a message. You can actually we, it, there's a message here to follow. So think about your, you know, your typical Facebook and Twitter concept. And then updates from those people would show up in a feed, what we call posts. So one of the ways that you'd be able to see you know, information back and forth with photos and with you know, those types of things could be right here. You know, once you have some people that you're following in your learning network, um, you can communicate with folks. One of the examples is um, this is designed to uh, be a cloud-based service from Blackboard where other schools would be able to you know, do the same thing. So you can make your profile searchable for you know, people at any other school at Blackboard that uses the same profile tool. So they, you could go and do a search for someone teaching in you know, some type of you know, humanities discipline. And you could get every example of people that teach that that are you know, sort of having their profile information searchable within here. And you could collaborate and communicate with people. So the design is you know, what LinkedIn and Facebook do for their various constituencies. We want to make an academic version of that for people that already use Blackboard today. Kind of like what Epsilon did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Epsilon was actually founded by one of the people that is sort of a brain behind this, actually. Oh, far. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, one of the other things that is, is new here as well, um, not only just this concept, but if you want to on your social, the, the profile, you can actually go through, and I did a mouse over of, of someone that I know that has linked a Facebook and Twitter profile if they want to. So you could do that. It's not syncing anything or bringing anything in. It's just going to allow me to you know, uh, see Greg's Twitter profile, and then I could choose to follow Greg on Twitter if I wanted to. You know, there's nothing that we're sort of sharing back and forth from those services, but if you want to you know, bring that in, you know, that's not uncommon for people to want to do that you know, in some way, shape, or form, um, just like Brad Cook, our VP of product development, whatever we want to do here. So let me go through. I have a couple of other examples. Any other questions while I fumble through a couple of other new pieces that I want to show you. Do you have a bulletin board feature like Linode or something that people could post to instead of Facebook? Because uh, we also get feedback from some of the students. They are very concerned about privacy. They don't want to go to Facebook. They yep. don't want to do X, Y, Z. They don't want to do Google. They just say, you know, I want my information to stay here. I don't want people to take my information and distribute it throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's going, I think. So. Well, this particular, so the posts tool. Like just posts things. And that's what this is. So this posts tool right here mm -hmm. would allow you to, you know, if anybody's following you, you could, you know, like a bulletin board. Mm -hmm. Um, looking for a study partner for course whatever you know and you could post that so anybody that follows you or you know that you've made yourself available to be followed by if you want to you know would see this show up and you can have an interactive discussion within groups of people other people would then see a notification of an update for the posts and they'd see this that you've posted there and you know they could then go and respond to you so if they wanted to this is outside of the construct of a course but inside Blackboard. This is not shareable to everyone in, in the universe here. This is only a Blackboard tool. So this might fit. A lot of teachers, they're in, you know, where they teach doesn't allow them to have Facebook. We have Coke employees. We're not allowed to yeah. do Twitter and Facebook. And, yeah. You know, and so there, it would be nice for that. And there's tons of concerns. We had a lot of good feedback in the first session about, you know, privacy. There's some technical things in the background about what gets shared and what doesn't. So we've got a pretty good FAQ that kind of bakes bakes all that through that I'll, I'll share with you as well. Can students then select different assignments from different classes and kind of build a portfolio as part of their ID? No, there, there is, um, so no they can't. So the only thing that they can really do as part of their uh, user profile, let me show you, is, okay I'll go and edit my Blackboard profile. 
So you can't really see this in the background, but you can do a little, what do you like to share about yourself? Your email address, your you know, study, your background, whatever it might be. Um, and then you choose who, how broadly you want to share that within the, the Blackboard community as well. Um, you can't specifically attach artifacts or files and things like that to it, like a profile tool or a portfolio tool. We have a portfolio tool actually. So for those that specifically want to have a, not it's not in line with this. It's separately licensed to have an actual you know e-portfolio tool, but having sort of objects that you could align to your profile might be a good uh, a good enhancement as well. What about the collaboration tool, where small groups come together and it's not as tedious as the session board? Yeah. So there's a couple couple updates there as well. Good. I'm glad that all the questions lead to things that I can make for good answers for. <laughs> um, so one thing that we've done is um, there's a new tool called Spaces. Um, and the concept of Spaces is today if you want to have um, a group or something inside your course, it's something that's really administrated by the, the faculty member. So you have to set up a group or a team and let them do their own work. But what we've built is a tool called Spaces that actually lets and users go and create their own thing. This could be a study group, this could be an intramural, whatever it might be, and they can actually request to create a space. It goes to get approval from some administrative body behind the scenes here, and then they could actually go and anyone could join this. You know, it could be a group that can post information and share information back and forth outside the construct of a course where they could collaborate and do their own thing if they wanted to. What about inside the course? Yeah. If I have literature circles and I want to see who's participating and to what extent. And collaboration is supposed to do that. We're supposed to be able to go into a room and some oh. online work and some don't. Got it. Okay. So uh, you're talking about the virtual classroom. Is it? Okay. Here you go. Uh, that's what I, I thought a second ago. I'm giving away some good stuff here. Hold on. So <clears throat> later this summer, we have our, our intent. I'm being recorded, so I have to say our intent, our best intent is later this summer we're actually replacing the old Java applet virtual classroom with a miniaturized version of our Blackboard Collaborate fully synchronous collaboration tool. So you would have something that looks like this with the ability to have whiteboard and screen sharing and chat, everything except the audio video components which are some of the other big core pieces of Blackboard Collaborate. Is this a downgraded version of the full Collaborate because there, we have recording functions? Yep, so that's exactly what it is, yeah. It's just downgraded? So you can't record? You can't have audio, you can't have video, but you can do whiteboard, screen sharing, all that kind of stuff. Yep. And one thing just that might be helpful, um, we are this summer, one of the things we're going to be doing at, at CTEL is, you know, looking at what do we want to do about video conferencing and, you know, mm -hmm. real-time collaboration. Right now, we sort of are dabbling in WebEx and Adobe and whatever, and we really kind of need to figure out, you know, what are we going to do about that? And you know, is that going to be something within Blackboard? Is that going to be something external like WebEx or Adobe? But that is something that we are looking at. So I'm glad to hear that there's some interest in that. And, and to that point, this is, the design here is kind of on that initial slide where I said trying to build value in the core product. This is, we're just trying to take the old virtual classroom, make it into something valuable, you know, something real that you can use. So I heard you say it, it couldn't be recorded. So can I go back in later and see? Or do I have to attend all of these? This is real time. So this bridge is where this is the light version that's free and included to what Susan just said. So we have a fully featured, fully synchronous um, virtual classroom tool that looks like this, only a little bit different with the recording capability, with audio video, with two-way. So if you want that fully featured sort of set that lets you record, lets you do all that, that's kind of its own baby because it is a very rich feature set on its oh, own. I can look at it later. But for no for no additional licensing, this is going to be included in the core product. Those people in Japan yeah. sleep at different times tonight. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, so we've got 14 minutes. So there's a couple things that I want to um, share as well. And if you guys want to take a quick note, we're not going to be able to get to every single thing. So take a note. Help.blackboard.com is where you can see a condensed version of, of new features here. Mm -hmm. So if you go to help.blackboard.com, go down to click on um, the what's new in Blackboard, or you can go to like one of these later service packs, SP10, mm -hmm. SP11. You'll get the laundry list along with slick little <laughs> videos um, for all these new things I'm talking about. Inline grading, um, I haven't talked about the retention center yet, but 
uh, calendar, the discussions updates, and you get audience specific notes for either system administrators, students, or uh, faculty members as well. So take a note of that if we can't get to every single thing. What about analytics? Why do I have to go and track everything and mark it and then just go in, mark, track student level? Why, did, why won't it just do it automatically and give me an automatic report when I want to? Who was where, when, doing what? Good, good question. Okay. So, uh, again, the... Uh, no, no, you're perfect because this is actually something, again, that I have a good answer for. So, this is... <laughs> nothing's ever worked out quite this well, but... <laughs> so, today, what you have access to um, in the notifications dashboard, for those who have ever used um, what we call the early warning system, this is a system that lets you track um, user behavior based on either logins, mm -hmm. uh, score, there's three different criteria. And to your point, to get value out of that today, you have to go in and set that up. Mm -hmm. That's a manual uh, task that you go in. You set up the trigger, the threshold, how you want it to alert the you. And if you want to see it, you have to go here. You have to hit refresh. It doesn't slap you in the yeah. face and say, hey, this is a problem. Yeah. So we have just contracted with Starfish. Ah, yeah. Who has your building block. David Yaskin, yeah. So, and I mean, that's going to be Tiger IQ starting later this summer. Mm -hmm. um, so from that piece, is it just going to, because that's supposed to just already pick up those things from our institution? Yep. So... Two-sided. Two so what I'm about to show you is a course level tool. So today, to kind of continue that original thought and then I'll jump over to where you're at, you have to go in and set up an early warning system rule. It's a manual set of tasks. What we've created is, this, this was also released um, earlier this year, is what we call the retention center. So you also get push notifications on that. But what this does is it automatically triggers you based on pre-built, you know, defining criteria of students that could be defined as at risk. So if I click on I'm a terrible faculty member because every course I have has a, a trigger of some kind, but I'll click on the details to show you one. So either it's going to be risk criteria based on missed deadlines, how frequently they've accessed the course, or, or what their score is. Um, so as soon as this loads here. Mm -hmm. So you'll see I'll, I'll maximize the screen. So this is within a course. So I can see that Catherine has been flagged. She's got the little red dot for missed deadlines. If I click on that, I see that. She's got two missed deadlines, and I can actually view what those missed or late submissions are. So this is, you haven't done anything as a faculty member. This is just telling you that there are students that have submitted something late, not at all. They haven't logged in in a certain period of time, whatever that is. And then if you want, you can even go through and choose to send a student an email notification based on that. So from right here, you can say, hey, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're not doing what you should to be successful in this course. You hit them right there if you want to. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can track them, you can sort of throw a shortcut to track Catherine when you hit monitor, it's going to, I was already monitoring her, but once you hit monitor she's going to show up in that shortcut list on the right. So you can kind of keep people top of mind of who you're working with. Exactly, the hit list. So, so this is inside a course. To your question about Starfish, what Starfish does is it actually mines the data underneath and takes that to a very broad you know, use case for someone that is a retention specialist, whatever that might be. So you right. get that at a very broad so level. As, as long as the instructor has, you get to set up your own, what are the thresholds for your class, and yep. then we're going to pull it out automatically so you wouldn't have to be submitting those things. Cool. Yeah, so. Yeah, so value there to broader audience, value here just for a faculty member for you know, enhanced insight in the course. So if a student submits a, this is another area, but if a student submits a paper like you showed before, mm -hmm. and uh, they do it in APA, mm -hmm. so I can immediately see that it's APA, mm -hmm. and can I turn a switch and have it uh, plagiarism check? Not yet. So this, to the question about safe assign, sort of blending that in. Safe assign. Yeah. It just screws up everything. Do, uh, you, do you guys use... Um, uh, turn it in or another tool as well? I've used that. I used that at my other university and I loved it. Okay. But there's problems with that too if you ask faculty. So. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's the feedback that I get too. Sometimes it has more features. Could there be more than one option and you can choose which one within Blackboard so you don't have to go outside? Yeah. You, the paper out? you can. If you license turn it in here as an institution wide license, you could actually build that in as a tool just like probably you're used to at your previous institution. And it's just like you have a safe assignment, you'd have a turn it in assignment. You could. Yeah. So that's 
change the formatting of the mm -hmm. document? You can't change the formatting of the document, though. So that's the that's sort of a it's a great idea, mm -hmm. but not there today. Mm -hmm. um, what formats will it, it uh, do in line for the this Word document? Microsoft Word, Excel, so the Office suite along with PDFs. Um, one of the issues uh, that our students, because a lot of our students are using Google, is that it completely destroys the formatting in Google. Yep. Um, is, the, is there any way that you're going to like be more acceptable to Google because... Uh, like a Google Docs document? Yeah, yeah today um, there isn't a direct way to take a submission, and I actually just saw a bug report. We're fixing something in a new update to allow... Um, uh, Google Doc submission because right now there's an issue with the way that right. SafeAssign processes Google Docs mm -hmm. content. So, um, so we're I mean it's kind of a they update we update you know it, it's always going to be that. But um, so there are some things in the works for that that probably aren't here today. Maybe Blackboard can buy SafeAssign. We SafeAssign is was acquired by Blackboard. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's why it's part of yeah. Blackboard because it's turn it oh, in. When you were saying they update then we have to update. Oh, we're talking about Google, Google Docs. Oh, Google Docs. Yeah. Does this look like we're just going to charts and everything? Yeah. Okay. So the user. Insider trading. There are new. So there's two other things that I want to share with you here um, around this. So, so there's a new. Uh, let me go into my correct demo course. Sorry. Um, there's a new item analysis feature. So for those of you that like to go back and do mm -hmm. item analysis, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that what we have today is not that great. Um, <laughs> well, to the point. So WebCT and Angel both had really, really robust mm -hmm. item analysis reports. Yeah. Blackboard did not, but this has been an update um, in the next version of what you have today. So the next item analysis version that you'll see, mm -hmm. you'll see much, yeah. much more like what you're used to from the WebCT and Angel side where you can see standard deviation, average, you know, time taken. You can even get flagged on what either is seen as a difficult or easy question. Mm -hmm. And you could go in and edit that on the fly. So you can say, okay, well, nobody got this thing right, so maybe there was something wrong. And you see, okay, well, maybe I just need to edit that test question. You can modify it on the fly. So we're trying to keep that, that loop again in play here. Um, yeah, so here. So you're, lo you're lobbing more softballs at me. I know we've got five minutes, but even if people have already taken the test, you're on service pack eight? What uh, do you know? Eight. Ten. Uh, Ten. In no, production? Eight. No, we're on eight. We're on eight now, but on the test server that we're going to be looking at that we're hoping to roll out. Got it. Because there's, so even there's something even newer here. So auto regrade. Have you seen auto regrade mm -hmm. today? where you can go in and edit something that's already been taken by other students? Right. Okay, so to that point, so if you want to edit something on the fly, you go in, you see your item analysis, you notice there was a question that was a little offbeat, you want to go and update it. You can edit it here, and you can update and regrade, so you know you can do that today. Okay, yeah. cool. So if you, like, clicked, in, if you meant to be in, you made it see on accident. Yeah, exactly. So it regrades it to give the impression. And it'll tell you, hey, there's already been 34 attempts here, make sure before you go, you know, touching things here. Um, to keep things in set with time, there uh, is one other uh, huge thing, and then I'll kind of, actually two other huge things. So the part that came out last night, the typical use case of you've got uh, students that either have some sort of special circumstance, they need more time to take a test. Maybe they were out of, they were sick, and they you know, just need to come back and take the test, whatever it is. Today, if you do that, there's a little trickery behind the scenes with multiple grade center columns and multiple versions of the same test. And so you can finally do all that in one place now. So now we have an exceptions area on your test settings where you could say for an individual or a group of people, you can say, okay, well, either an individual user or a group, she needs to have multiple attempts. And she also needs to have 60 minutes instead of 40 minutes. And you know, you could even set up the time availability. So she's not going to be back on campus. She's at home in another country for a while. She's going to be back on campus. You can set all that up, um, which you haven't been able to do in the past. You can do that for individuals and groups, unlimited numbers of people, whatever, however you want to configure it. And then something else the WebCT crowd always kind of um, really asked for is the way that you provide the feedback to students as well. So um, med schools and nursing schools particularly have um, ask for this a lot. They want to change the way that they provide feedback for high-stakes testing. 
So after a test has been completed, what do you want to show a student on the screen? Either what they got right or wrong, you know, the whole total score of the test. Do you not want to make that available until everyone has completed the test? All those options are now available as well. So again, this was something that Angel did before and WebCT sort of could do on the release. But we've tried to bake in all that, you know, things that everybody wanted. And now you can do multiple nested versions of on, on a due date, after a due date, after the availability is over, after everything's graded. You can show what the students do see when they do see it. Um, so that's, I thought people would get excited about that. That's a really good thing. I am wondering, though, for blind students, how are you, I mean, are you guys working on things behind the scene that it can actually speak the test to them, or? That's a little magic right now. Right. What we're doing is making, um, if we go to, uh, we actually are the, you'll hear this from everybody that comes in the door, we're the uh, first LMS that's been certified by the National Federation for the Blind. We're also the only LMS that has been verified by an independent third party. So we've just gone through our audit. If you go to blackboard.com accessibility, you'll see all the stats. So we don't read back, but we support Dragon, screen readers, all those other types of accessibility tools. Um, this isn't coming up, but... Oh, so... But you can check it out if you want. There we go. Thank you for seeing my typo. But here you'll see all the various certifications and things. The last thing that I want to show you um, is uh, we had a question about uh, content. So we're talking about open education resources. Honestly, don't know. I'll find out for you. Um, I have one more question. Um, the timer, do you, can you set up a different timer, especially for the student with disability? Mm -hmm. They need a set, set the timer. Can you set a different yep. timer for that? You can. That was one of the options, um, the timer, and then whether you force auto submit or not. Yeah. I'll find out. We have a help page for that, so let me see. Else. Yeah, I was wondering because if I set up the entire, um, the entire task for 60 minutes and mm -hmm. then I go on an exception, 30 minutes, so which one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of yeah, I don't kind of think tricky. the exception would override the... Right, I would think so. We've got... I'll, I'll ch if you want, when I roll out, check out the help.blackboard.com, the whole FAQ on it. Otherwise, I'll find out for you. Um, the internet goes down, it drops the student, but it submits the test. We don't want to go in and clear the entire test, but we want to be able to add minutes to that student's test. Is that possible? That's still not available oh. today. Um, yeah. <laughs> we're actually, yeah, we're actually, um, for great feedback like that, if you, if you don't mind, if you go to, if you just do a Google search for um, Blackboard Enhancement Request, you'll see it's the number one search that comes up. <laughs> take that for what you, take that for what you will. But you can go here. Printing off so I can figure out what they did and then reset the test and go, yeah. now you go back and do 26 to 7. Yeah. There, there, are there are a couple of. Uh, there, we're actually so we're we're working on a couple ways to do that. There's some technical hurdles right now, but the more that we hear from the field, you know, I'll go back and share that. But the more people that take the time to go in and submit an enhancement request, it would go a long way. I've had a student every single test this year. I've had multiple students end up with that problem, and it's not everyone across the class, and it's not the same people every time. I was talking with Susan about that beforehand. There's yeah, been some scenarios there. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, this is just something totally different regarding tools and bulk email messages. Mm -hmm. Why can't I add some other outer email into that? It won't let me do anything. Insert just the ones up there, boom, in there. Could I do that? Uh, Can I just send bulk email based on my email list or something? Or? Let me come back to that. I don't know. So you just want to be able to paste in a list of email addresses in the yeah, to field? other than what, I, what is automatically in there, taken from the registrar's office. Yeah, right. that's, that's actually sort of a security feature. Well, if I want to send an email, like let's say include another person, and somebody outside Blackboard. Yeah, or no, in the Blackboard or outside. Yeah, just right. It's a security issue. Well, and in fact, um, one thing that we are probably going to do this summer is lock down Blackboard email addresses because 
right now, students can go into Blackboard and change their email address. They can. And the problem with that, it, it, and Mark is <laughs> sitting there doing this, there are some there are some problems with that in terms of what's their is, official yeah. university email address. And we want those messages to go out of Blackboard to their official mm -hmm. address. And it's their responsibility to forward that to an email that they do read if they don't I read their that, but their For example, I make my course available one month before and I send out emails for etc. meeting, they don't get the emails because the system is not open yet, although I make my course mm -hmm. available. So they receive nothing. And here I am waiting for meetings, etc. Nobody's mm -hmm. received anything. And you can do that outside of Blackboard. You can send email messages to your students but I want to use Blackboard so that they get, you know, because the the, you're making the course available, yet you're not making the tools available somehow. The students aren't in the courses yet. But they're registered. But, but they're not in, but they're not in the course. course. Yeah. Those are two separate I know, processes. I don't know, but it's just a suggestion to make life easier for the for And the that's staff. actually a decision we make yeah. here, not part of Blackboard functionality. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, <coughs> I'd be glad to walk through it to mm -hmm. kind of yeah. share that with you. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is a new, so kind of going back to the whole um, Cable Green open education resources for those that have an interest in sharing content, reusable content. What, um, so what we've done is um, we have gone through, I'm going to jump out of my course, we've created a new shareable cloud-based content repository that we call Explore, X-P-L-O-R, cross-platform learning object repository. You know, we can't do anything that's very uh, simple, but yeah, you can brand it whatever you want. We can call it. But what it, what it is is it, it's it's valuable for a couple reasons. So let me show you. So it lets you share content between multiple kinds of LMSs in a centralized way. So you create a test in Explore. You can actually share that test in. This is what it looks like in Blackboard. This is what it looks like in Angel. This is what it looks like in Moodle. This is what it looks like in Sakai. So these are essentially these supported uh, LMSs right now that use this initial standard from the IMS consortium. Um, so but what it does is it means that if you create content, you can actually make it open to a broad audience of folks, not people that just use Blackboard or people that just use something else, people that use Moodle or Sakai, open source tools as well, and maybe more down the road, some of the other two that you're looking at. But um, what you can do is, you can actually discover content, so you can search for things, and you'll notice that Khan Academy is one of the partners that we use out of the gate. So you could search for Khan Academy content. Um, you know, this particular piece of Khan Academy content was about pre-algebra. This is a K-12 specific piece. You can look at the peer ratings. You can see how many people are subscribing to this piece of content out there. Think of like Amazon and your ratings and how much, you know, feedback that something like that gets. A lot of stars, a lot of good feedback. So you can say, all right, I love this, I'm going to add it to my course. So I'm going to go and I added this Khan Academy video to my course. That's what I just did. So now I go back, and of course for my demo here it says error, so we'll see what we got. But um, this is something that's in beta right now that's going to be released later this year. So, um, yeah, so it... Will that tool um, <coughs> databases from other open educational resources besides creating content It will. So. So anybody, Merlot is the one example today. We're looking for folks that are, are going to be able to partner and, and search through this database. So if I search for, um, let me just choose one of these, like physics as an option here. So what you'll notice we can do is, so you'll see the little logo for Creative Commons. You can set copyright. You can choose what you share. You could even go through and choose to uh, take a piece of content that you've built in your Blackboard course, a test, upload it into Explore, stamp it, Creative Commons, Open Education Resource. You could take your entire course from Blackboard, export it as a common cartridge course, put the entire course in Explore, and let other people use it as well. So what we're doing is we're build, we've are we built a framework open to multiple types of LMSs, search utilities, rating abilities, the ability to manage copyright, the ability to set up the type of you know, shareable content that you want. You can add external LTI links. So different, different things that you want to do. But it's a new way to create and share content, and it's a new way to go out and search for existing content as well, Khan Academy and Merlot being a couple of examples. For things like when you're saying the whole cartridge and you're putting the cartridge out there, how are you actually keeping students? Because we all, I mean, if you do graduate class, 
you have people who are faculty at other places taking your class yeah. who can go out there and get everything. Well, we can't, we can't I mean, prevent that. But right. I didn't know if that's something that people would have <coughs> Yeah. I mean, that's the one downside to open resource if you're sharing yep. testing and type things that it's like looking in the back of the book when we were in high school and all the answers were there. It's, it's the same concept of if they could find it through a Google right. search or something, too. But I, I right. see your point. I, we're, we're trying to, you know, go through. We've got a framework here to, to make it happen. We don't really have any way to track or prevent or lock that out yet. Um, but that is kind of like you said. So there's a bunch more types of things that you can do. Like I said, import common cartridge. You can take your entire course and share it. You can also bake in a channel. So Fort Hayes could have their own content channel for content. So you could say these are the things that we're sharing. We've decided as an institution to make open, o, make OER and send that out, and other people can subscribe and use your content or things that you've created as well. Or maybe you know the partner institutions overseas they could utilize this in a very easy and searchable way. No more exporting and importing your course. You know. The, the benefits are pretty big, and I'm not doing it a lot of justice, but this is something that's been in beta for um, since last summer. Uh, we just finished our second field trial, and then this summer at BB, well, this summer I'm being recorded. Our hope, our intent is that this, this year or later this year we'll have this available to everybody as well. And those, there's going to be different features available with different functions as well. We are, we build it, it's, uh, it's the field of dreams. We're trying to build it and we're waiting for people to come. So to answer your question, we, we can't police it, yeah. If you stamp it Creative Commons and it's open and no copyright. Right, I mean that's, that's up to you, you know, if you've decided to make your materials available, then you make them available. If you're skittish about that, you might not want to do that yet. Yeah. And that's exactly, it's, it's not for everyone, but they're, you know, for the, you know, the presentation that you heard probably from Cable, I mean, this is something, you know, we're trying to lower the cost of education across the board. Share. Sh you know, share reusable objects. Maybe you only want to get a question set from one quiz, a very granular part. You could do that, you know. Um. Yeah, I was, I, I was asking from a publisher perspective because we were used a lot of content, not just from open education resources, but from publishers that yep. they have. Yeah. <clears throat> then you would be violating it. We cannot. Yeah. Right. So I was Put those out there. Yes. Yeah. But we, we can't, again, so to your point, if you have a course, you import a EPAC from Pearson, Cengage, Wiley, mm -hmm. McGraw-Hill, and you take that and make stamp it common cartridge and throw it up, mm -hmm. we don't know what you do with it, you know? Yeah. But, but Pearson will know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it'll be marked on here as coming from the author, whoever the author may be. You know, I'm... There's, the, this, is, this is not even out in the field yet. So I, I appreciate all the questions, but it's sort of a, a year down the road when we see those come up, we'll, we'll have better answers for you as well. That would be go to jail and collect 200. Yeah, so the um, good question. The question we got was all the new features, are they integrated in the app now? The update that we have coming this summer, the inline grading that I just showed you, that is our intent is to have that available in the mobile app mm -hmm. this summer on the tablet based iPad version, whatever you've got. So you'd be able to do that grading workflow on your mobile device. There are other updates going along with that. This is right now taking the cake in terms of the, the investment from our side. So our hope and our intent is that the other things that you saw will slowly blend in um, more instructor facing types of tools. Because you can't grade it, it just slides. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. So you got to. The, the hope is that you'll eventually be able to use the app for all that kind of stuff instead of trying to do the mm -hmm. on a shrunken down version. Any any uh, developments in the interface, the design, and the whole thing the, as they click on it? You know, the banners up there, etc. You know, it's so boring in a way. There's and even to put a banner in there is like. Um, yeah. So some of the boring is up to you to make it as boring as you want as an institution. <laughs> Well, Good well, and Good I, I say that sort of, I, I wasn't trying to be facetious. Um, the, the design that we've, we, so some of the updates that we've done are in just sort of smoothing out the overall parts of the interface. As far as the color scheme, the institution can change every part of the look and feel. But inside the course itself, no, there's nothing. It's outside of colors and overall sort of round square. Yeah, the left navigation is always going to be the left navigation as, as of now, yeah. 
But I encourage you to go to help.blackboard.com um, to check out those, those updates. And there was one other thing that's coming in, in terms of product updates. Thanks, everybody, that, that was able to come. Another thing that we intend to release later this year as well is a, is a date rollover tool. So for those of you that build a course, mm -hmm. somehow reuse it and modify it for the next term. You want to bulk update your release dates and dates like that. We're um, coming up with a way to do that uh, in the next set of updates as well. Yeah. So I talk really fast. That was a lot of information. Yeah. Well, it's good. It's good. The good news is almost all that is available today. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, again, we want you guys to keep up with the later updates mm -hmm. and, and all that so you can leverage some of this. And we've had great questions, and I appreciate your time. Thanks for staying over as well. Yeah.